So what we have here is a chain of cute small islands below North America. And here we have very similar cute small islands below South America. Can it really be a coincidence? They even seem to be the same number. And as if that is not enough, in both cases we see straight lines at the exactly same positions, as if huge bulldozer made both of them. So this is the necklace of islands, this is the line, and here if we zoom in we see strange stuff on the ocean bottom. And if this is a true radar image, here we have even the traces of those excavators or bulldozers which made this plateau and the water plateau. But of course it doesn't look like a real radar image. It looks like this entire area has been selected here. Yes, this has been selected. And after that some sort of distortion tool has been applied here. Means they want to hide something. So it may not be necessarily excavator marks, but probably there is something suspicious next to this regularly shaped plateau. So this episode will be about various curious features of the landscape of both Americas, which uh, I find it's extremely hard to call natural, at least in the sense of the word that most people accept nowadays. Of course, if we take that mother nature means a highly intelligent being who has created this environment for us, then I can accept it. But still, most likely there were other beings helping as well, and probably many of them throughout the ages. So the face of the earth here in Alaska appears as if it has been scraped by very furious winds. But then, when we start looking at the details, it turns out that these winds were also kind of scooping the earth. So they were not winds after all. And it even looks like as if the same gigantic scoop was grabbing earth again and again. Please ensure that you are watching this episode in HD resolution and full screen Otherwise, many of the details will not be visible. Now, let's see various images from North America, which appear to be quite curious. And this uh, mysterious line, is this a canal or what? It is definitely intelligent design, but it goes from nowhere to nowhere, goes across uh, flowing rivers without a bridge, so it really seems to be historic, this line, and yet uh, below it 
we're gonna see a modern infrastructure partially maybe related to an old earth damn very weird very very weird Now, Nazca style lines are found all over both Americas. Occasionally, they also form pictures, maybe not as um, artistically sophisticated as the monkeys and spiders at Nazca, but definitely the grid line is the same. Basically, the grid continues throughout the two continents and, as we're gonna see in the future episodes, all over the full planet. Very often the modern infrastructure is built on places, junctions of this old grid. For example, here the tick line is 100 meters wide. So these are not small things. Again, we see some piece of modern infrastructure on it. Or it could be that also some of the lines are not even old. Maybe they still build them because they know how the grid functions and how to use it. But of course, the common people don't know. remains of an ancient dam out there in the desert now but this has been a river once upon a time and at that time there were people who were building dams again interesting uh, where the plateau has eroded all around there are no lines but where the old surface has survived there are lines. A modern airport. But has it been built on the remains of an older structure? This is the old Probably the old terminals were here. Is this another old run runway that didn't get a modern airport made on it? The width of the runway here is some 20 meters. And again, so many dams on a river that no longer exists. They are over a kilometer long, each of them. We see some complex, also, maybe uh, they were built over time as the river was getting smaller and smaller or something like that. So many 
items. Some figure here. Well, apparently, the people who were building these dams lived on the area for a long time because this is when the river was later on much smaller, they built a smaller dam. Again, the lines connected to the dams. The lines here are 20 meters wide. If we assume that the lines were drawn when the river didn't exist at all, then the line building must have been and dam building must have been going on for a long time as the climate was changing. This cannot be streets, such complicated wide boulevards where nobody has lived for ages. Again, out there nowhere, really in a deserty place, sort of traces of who has been doing something here and you can find thousands of uh, similar examples yourself probably even much more interesting than the ones I'm showing you how to find them just open any satellite map look for regions that are less populated especially the deserty regions and you will be finding lots of stuff this is in the very cold parts of Canada. The lines seem to be partially submerged. Now, if somebody uh, still doubts that some of these lines could be done by the forestry department to keep inventory of the forests, for example, here it transpires that uh, this can't be the case, because would they be transporting heavy equipment to each and every tiny flooded island in this swampy area just to cut a small part of the line not also making the grid will be quite difficult the lines are meters wide we often see that even they are full of water and uh, yeah they would also need maintenance as well these are some photos of them taken from a low-flying airplane. Again, this is in North America. If we want to understand the Nazca lines, we have to study them in their entirety, the entire network all over the world, and not only on the Nazca Plateau. A giant Sri Mandala in Oregon, 20 kilometers long. Now these are images, mostly from California, some from Florida as well. Officially, these are areas which have never been inhabited. Some of them are parts of what is officially called pristine nature reserves. But then, who dug out the grid lines again? And also, do you notice the dots along the lines? I have no clue what that is, but similar dots are found as part of uh, geoglyphs in South America, the area of Titicaca, I believe.
actually the parts of this grid which are not flooded are repopulated again and the parts of the modern cities are built on the top of the old infrastructure. This is one of the most puzzling photos for me. These are these very same areas with the flooded canals and we see these are like old electricity poles. Yeah, looks like that. So, so then the question arises, is this um, obviously damaged grid of canals still in use when there was electricity already? Well, that's very recent, I mean, mass usage of electricity, that's pretty modern. And if not, what are these poles anyway? Was there another electricity? I mean, another electric grid with electricity before the one we know of? There are speculative theories along those lines. Now let's have a look at the elongated, supposedly natural spits of Alaska. Starting somewhere here, the full coastal line appears to be intelligently manipulated all the way to here and possibly even much further. This is the official explanation of how these spits came to be. Dominant waves approach from the northwest, creating elongated spit. Okay, so that's the theory. Now let's look at the reality, the photographs. First of all, besides the fact that the spits look a little bit too elegant stretching over many thousands of kilometers to be purely natural meaning appearing only driven by the force of the tides and waves but also at places where there is no spit and the coastline meets the ocean directly, we have also a very, very regular shape. We can't blame these precise lines again on the currents and the waves because those tend to cause erosion on the coast, leaving behind a shaggy looking edge. Coast, I mean. Of course, not always, sometimes even the forces of the winds and the waves can produce very regular looking coastal lines, but those are relatively short stretches. The stretches here are not only thousands of kilometers long, but also they beautifully fit the design of the spits. And there is yet another feature of this elegant looking coastal line of Alaska which might be able to give us a clue as of the 
artificial origin of all this coastal line artwork I would say and that's what looks like partially, partially submerged harbors now something that looks like a harbor and an actual proven harbor are different things but I think we have a good chance to have real harbors because a man called John Jensen studied similar looking ruins on the more densely populated coastal parts of America and discovered a good number of massive old ports which not only seem to be submerged and destroyed to an extent exactly as this spit in Alaska and the ruins around it but also the ports that he studied are connected with the same grid of life lines that I've been showing you in Alaska do you see the regularly shaped submerged canal this is not modern we have inherited this from the people that I call survivors and he calls them the ancient canal builders but these are the very same people the work of John Jensen is really amazing because one thing is to see some underwater channels on photograph and something else is to become aware of their actual size and dimension these are truly colossal projects as he calls them he also calculated how much would it cost to build some of them in modern currency and it amounts to hundreds of millions of dollars As the Amazon forest is being cut down, geoglyphs, which were formerly covered with vegetation and thus invisible, now become visible. It's quite few of them and the size is sometimes quite impressive, reaching the height of over 20 meters. Quickly, the geoglyphs were declared a mystery because, you see, the population in the past in the Amazon jungle was minimal so there couldn't have been a civilization to build them, right? It turns out that the last piece of information about the population of the Amazon basin is yet another modern historical fantasy Even a short couple of hundred years ago the information in the history books was much more truthful. There were quotes with what the first explorers saw there. As they were traveling with their boats, the banks of the rivers were black with people. It was so densely populated. Those explorers also reported that the natives had very orderly social structure and lived in beautiful cities and since we are looking at the aerial images in this video there are strange things on the water as well but uh, let alone are they historical do they even exist because all the images we get are digital composite images means photoshopped but photoshopped what a real image or fantasy or what somebody told you to make make look like real it 
In reality, we have a more or less satisfactory images taken from the height of an airplane only of the densely populated areas on Earth. About everything else, actually, we cannot find any really reliable information about anything else because the only thing that we are given is computer-generated images. Now, for example, these are images that they are telling us are sent from Mars. Are they really from there? I don't know, but at least that's what they are telling us. I'm going to step off the left now. One small step for man, one giant leap. So, I guess you want to do it again. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Corsi. And more images, all from Mars, allegedly. Even the particles of dust are visible. This is, uh, I believe, a hole on Mars, one centimeter wide. So we see the dust even. Such a crisp photography. Okay, so if they can show us Mars so well, then what about our own Earth? Look at this stunning quality. Isn't it fantastic? Superb! And here is where all these high-resolution images come from. This is an official computer-generated image, of course, of all those satellites that are orbiting the Earth, they are telling us. And you see, you can select each and every of them and it will give you information, everything about the given satellite. So each and every second, all these satellites take countless high-resolution images of the Earth. They are telling us for the purpose of weather forecasting, scientific research, exploration of natural resources, improving of the maps that we have on the Earth, and so on and so forth. And that's why we get these fantastic images. Aren't they lovely? But I've got something even more lovely. Doesn't it look gorgeous? Hmm? Yeah, only if you don't look into the details. It's not photoshopped very professionally. See, they were pasting on the same clouds again and again. But wait a minute. This... Where is then the actual image? We don't have any actual images at all. That's the truth. And it's not that real images don't exist. They exist, but they spoil them like this on purpose before they release them to the public. Do you see the pattern that they put on the top? For example, here we had a nice aerial image. And do you see the blurry rectangular area. This is not a area without an image. If it was, the edges would be straight. No, this is a image blurring tool made on the top of the crisp image. No chances are taken and with a thick and non-transparent brush and manually they obliterate shallow water images. And to make it even more difficult to see, whatever tiny remnants of information from the radar images of the ocean bottom they have published, they put this nasty water on the top. Do you see the moving white yellowish stuff? These are not natural waves. This is their beautiful water that you cannot even disable, strangely enough. Some map providers 
put such dark colors for the ocean that you can't see a thing anyway. This is not a photograph, but this is anyway a computer generated or it is supposed to be computer generated uh, image from the results of the scanning of the ocean bottoms. So colors are attached by the computer. If they were making it really with educational purpose, then why not use colors and contrasts which are actually visible for the human eye? Just look at this monstrous distortion of the image. This is just crazy. This is how well you can see underwater when the weather is peaceful and this is the reason for which they blur all the water. No chances are taken. Bing Maps tend to keep the older versions somewhat longer. The older versions of the uh, images from the bottoms of the oceans because uh, the newer ones get uh, worse and worse, obviously worse and worse. But then Bing maps are too dark. To see what is actually on their images, I need to make a copy of them, a video or a photographs, then uh, take them through image editing program and then they become usable and visible. And then the different map providers at the same time give uh, different images for the same region and you wonder are these uh, some sort of uh, real images or some kid is uh, playing with uh, Photoshop and they're posting it as a scientific work. So here two map providers give us a different picture for the same place supposedly. Of course I have to make it lighter to even show you the image. In 2012, Google Maps and Google Earth made a major update on the images that we get from the bottoms of the oceans, hopefully. So what they did, not only they introduced a new version, but also they substituted the older versions with the new ones and put an old date on them. In other words, they made it look like as if the older version never existed and removed all traces of it. But luckily, some users of uh, the software program called SAS Planet kept on their computers locally saved copies of the older version. So on the left hand side you can see the older version and on the right hand side the modern one that you can see on Google Earth or Google Maps even now. The ocean bottom on the right one, the new one, appears to be suspiciously smooth. This doesn't happen in nature. And interestingly enough, mostly the structures on the water that appear to have intelligent design in the Hyperborean region were the ones mostly affected by this update. Of course, there is no guarantee that even the old version had anything to do with the reality. But even the very fact that it is removed in such a sly way maybe gives some clue that it was truthful, more or less. Otherwise, why would Google, a party which is a leader in imposing 
of this artificial fraudulent reality upon us would remove it. And of course, the things that got deleted clearly appear to have an artificial design. Two other interesting things are to be noticed on uh, the satellite images of Alaska. And these are the patterned ground, which looks like some sort of fields, as you see right here. And then the numerous regularly shaped lakes. Their official name is Oriented Lakes. First of all, the fields or the patterned ground, their side would be, let's say, 10-20 meters. They look quite natural, but what kind of natural forces could have made them? You see, they are fenced with stones. So there is uh, quite a few mainstream hypotheses about how these uh, patterns could have come to existence. And they don't sound very good, like, uh, for example, the stones, due to temperature fluctuations, started moving. Yeah, quite big stones, 20 meters away. And that's like the best uh, they can offer in terms of explanation, not very sensible. And then in regards to the so-called oriented lakes, there are published scientific works about them. And um, in a nutshell, they blame it, of course, on the winds. Some special sort of winds, of course. But I read a small remark that also they, uh, they found regularly shaped lakes in areas where the special winds don't blow. So those remain a mystery. Okay. So again, no satisfactory explanation. And there are similar things and sites all over the world. Like this is a particularly beautiful one from Bolivia. And of course, there are some geological explanations for some of them, but they are quite speculative and often unsatisfactory. They often sound very childish, but they have to be childish to be published in a scientific publication because that's the full purpose of this TV religion, as I call it. The main mantra of it is, the scientists said, all this is meant to keep humanity anchored in a childish paradigm of existence. So I see three main points which we need to take into consideration to find out one day what is the actual process by which such regularly shaped things came into existence. That includes patterned ground, stone columns, tightly stacked next to each other, like in the case of the Devil's Tower of Wyoming, and also the stone spheres.
initially the categories that I just listed may appear to be unrelated, but as you look at the images now, you will start feeling the connection between them. So now what are the things that we need to take into consideration? Number one, this beautiful earth that we live on is not only a product of the natural forces, it was created by intelligent beings and it has been regularly manipulated on large scale. That includes initial creation of everything following an intelligent design, subsequent large-scale landscape refashioning on a colossal scale of which the Alaskan shore is probably a part, and also distractions by the negative forces again on a colossal planetary scale and possibly even mining on a scale unimaginable for us. Then number two, stones can be living creatures. These are again the Trovant stones from Romania. They grow like mushrooms, especially after rain. They multiply, they have families. Sometimes they have temporary flower-like formations growing on them. And finally, number three, natural landscapes can be also changed with the help of waves, like for example sound waves, that is just one of the type of energy waves that can be put at work. You can find many videos on YouTube about how sound can move objects. The main purpose of this entire documentary, The Survivors of Atlantis, is to point your attention to one single fact. Not only we have been lied about our history, actually that's a minor problem. The bigger one is that we also live in a paradigm built up with lies only in the current moment. We don't have the slightest clue what kind of lies are they? Because we believe that they are reality. And sadly, this artificial paradigm that we have been boxed in is a nightmarish one. And that's why most people currently on the planet have difficult lives, which is unnatural for a human being. We have been designed to function, to live in harmony and peace. This is the most important thing, the single most important thing that the Great Spirit of the Amazon showed to me. And ever since that, I have embarked on my personal journey of replacing the paradigm of lies with the truth. And if you want to come to the true world with me, Watching and even taking to heart the survivor's documentary won't be enough. You will also need a pure heart to experience the truth. Because even if I pour on your head from the screen divine knowledge, you will collect it in the cup of your mind and that will be poisoned with the beliefs that you hear from TV or from other people who watch TV. The poisons from the cup will contaminate the pure knowledge. That's why the road to happiness starts, first of all, with switching off the TV, which seeds lies and negative behavior patterns to those which it hypnotizes. Second, by not drinking alcohol, because that waters those seeds of negativity and fertilizes them. And third, starting a regular meditation practice.
This documentary will be about the forgotten technique of growing stone, rock, in the same way as we cultivate plants and mushrooms in particular. Are these footsteps left in the soft stone? Do you notice this crisp edge here? It reveals how this stone was formed. It wasn't the lava flow, it was growing from below, rising pretty much as a dough does. Is this rock glue? Initially, I started my inquiry into this field because I was looking for an answer to the question how were the meltalites built. The meltalites are a curious group of structures which many consider to be intelligently made megaliths. Actually, their general appearance is definitely that of a natural stone formations, but with one small detail. Here and there, there are parts, tiny small parts of them, which don't look natural at all, even to geologists. After I made myself familiar with the absolutely brilliant research of Anthony Aksenov, not only the origin of the meltalites became crystal clear, but a couple of other mysteries also got resolved, like for example the Seda stones. Sometimes they are described as defying the laws of physics. No, they don't defy any laws at all. They defy our assumptions of what those laws could be. Other mysteries for which I finally found explanation are curious formations like the Devil's Tower in Wyoming, the split rocks which leave the impression as if they have been cut with some sort of a precision instrument. Artifacts found in stone, stone which when put under tests shows to be millions of years old, yet look at the year of manufacturing of this coin. And last, but obviously not least, an entire chapter of the most amazing story of the creation of our planet revealed itself for me. Even though I always knew that only a supreme consciousness can fashion such an amazing world and engineer such complex structures, still the actual details of how the Earth was engineered and how the project was carried out remained somewhat misty. Now the truth about the details of how our Earth, including us, was engineered and made by the Creator is emerging again. The Earth, the air, the fire, the water, return, 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 return. The Earth, the air, the fire, the water, return, 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 return. Aye, aye, aye. The purpose of this documentary is not to convince you 
that some unknown aliens have come to create all the mysterious objects and structures, but to show you that the forces of nature themselves are intelligent beings, pretty much like me and you. Now let's start with relatively simple looking species of stone. Officially they are called concretions. Although the process of formation, even of the simplest concretions, is not yet properly understood by official science, still, of course, this um, doesn't prevent them from confidently assuring us on TV and in textbooks that once upon a time lived a cute small snail and then he died and then around his house clay or other matter got stuck, accumulated, you know, and that's how these balls formed. In reality, the concretions are much more complex creation than simply a dust which stuck to the house of the cute small snail. And it's not just the very complex internal structure, also they tend to kind of spill out of their form, the globular form, to the point that they kind of fill up the entire space around themselves. And we are not talking about some rare exotic examples here. These are sites which are easily to be found all over the world by dozens. And not only these stones look as if they have been made of a door that has risen, but also at other places it looks as if door that has not yet risen has been inserted in some sort of um, skeleton or mesh or grid and the soft doll tries to preserve this shape of uh, globular circular growth within the boundaries of the cell. Now let's see what has the official science discovered about this type of rocks. Orbicules are found in igneous, metamorphic, and magmatitic terrains, and are not restricted to unusual or limited compositions. Hypothesis of orbicule genesis include both magmatic and metamorphic origins for these rocks. However, no single hypothesis provides a general explanation. Some orbicule shells result from exchange of material between core and matrix. No correlation has been demonstrated between orbicule structure, chemical composition, or gross geologic setting. No single hypothesis provides a general explanation. Okay, no hypothesis provides explanation. That in simple words means they have no clue. I say they don't want to have a clue. The clue is right in front of their eyes, but they don't want to see it because then it will become evident that many other of the so-called proven laws of nature that they have been telling us fairy tales about were simply wrong assumptions. I'm just trying to be polite. Actually, most of them were intentional lies. 
And as far as these interesting stones that I've been showing you, they're alive and they grow. And the proof of that are not only the countless similarities between the looks of the stones and various species from the plant kingdom, but also we have living example of species of stone. And these are the Trovant stones of Romania. Just look at them. What is the difference between them and the other stones that I've been showing you so far? There is no difference at all. Just the Trovants are fast growing. The other stones might be simply growing slower or they might have reached maturity. Maybe some different type of yeast, so to say, has been used in the case of the stones which appear not to grow. Appear doesn't mean they don't really grow, but maybe we simply can't notice it or don't want to notice it. So what is the mainstream explanation for the Trovant stones or the TV explanation? Well, they're made of some special thing inside that is so dense that when you water it, it expands. But this concretion thinks that this is calm explanation because the Trovants reproduce as well. In a couple of years, small pieces of them fall apart and then those babies continue to grow and become adult Trovants themselves. In a certain mountain region of uh, China, they also have uh, rocks which produce flower-like blossoms, also made out of rock. Locals say that the flowers last about two years. Actually, the very idea that a lot of the rocks around us have grown pretty much like plants shouldn't be even surprising to anybody for the simple reason that rocks consist of minerals. And minerals, they grow. In just a couple of days, anybody can grow absolutely beautiful and amazing minerals at home. And all one needs are basic substances which are very easy to find and get. Not only minerals grow, but just have a look in what kind of shapes do they grow. The very same shapes of the stones I've been showing you previously. Actually, after all this, it would be strange if the stones didn't grow and not that I'm suggesting that they grow. Sometimes even mainstream sources refer to certain minerals as being alive. This is a marine creature, yet another candidate for a living stone. A couple of minutes ago I used a rising door as a comparison. And it seems that's exactly how entire hills and mountains were grown. Do you notice how certain segments fermented, so to say, much better? This cannot be a result of, let's say, a lava flow, because if that was the case, then the bulges would follow the flow of lava, while here we can clearly see that they are connected with the grid and not with 
an imaginary flow of lava. as if the more fragile or maybe even soft substance was supported by a stronger mesh or grid. We don't know yet which came first or did they grow together. And here is your hill, it's ready! Here, the mixture didn't rise well, or another possible scenario is that it eroded to expose the grid. Just notice how the mini loaves of bread are rising while they retain the sides, the sharp, crisp edges that they had before they came out of the mold or the grid. I think on this spot they might have put a little bit too much yeast. And again, compare with the minerals, which use the same support structure to grow. And this is stone art in the real sense of the word. But a growing substance that rises, supported by a grid, wasn't the only option. There also grow rocks, stone, mountains, as mushrooms. As the cluster of mushrooms used to multiply, eventually they would fill up the full space. This is the famous Cappadocium. Officially, it is considered that these protrusions, mushroom-like protrusions, are just results of ordinary erosion. Namely, the cap that survived kind of protected the layers below, 
And that's why the layers below didn't get carried away by the elements as everything else around in that layer. That is the official version. But if you take a look at this portion of the photograph, you will see how the mushrooms emerged with their mushroom shape already clearly visible as the erosion advances on the slope. Although eventually everything was overgrown, still the stems remained stronger and continued standing, having of course a higher density. And as you look at the examples of mushroom stones that I'm gonna show you, don't disregard them just because, hey, not everything that looks similar is the same. Remember that not only the huge stone mushrooms look like the mushrooms in the forest, but also the minerals. They grow following exactly this very same pattern. All the minerals that you see are not shaped in this way by a jeweler. They grow in this form naturally. And the rocks are not only closely related to the minerals, they consist of minerals. Sometimes even the terms are used interchangeably. And now, keeping in mind everything you saw till now, have a new look at the Seda stones. Some people also call them balancing rocks. Well, actually, many and probably most of them are simply mushroom-like grown stones and why they don't fall off well for the same reason that the caps of the mushrooms in the forest don't fall from their stems the heavy top part of the stone mushrooms could be supported by the so-called maybe stone fibers or i'm not sure how to call them which connect that grow from the stem and go in the upper part of the mushroom. That could be the case in some, with some of them. Yet others which have their top part completely physically disconnected from the stem, they could be still supported by the energy grid on which the stone was cultivated. But it is possible that not all sedas are stone mushrooms. Some of them could be supported by magical spell or somebody's strong wish. These terms again can be used interchangeably here. Choose the one that better resonates with you. But even if magical spells were used to create the support for a given seda, Still, 
In practical terms, at the end, the job would be carried out by creating a supporting energy structure, again in the form of some sort of grid, similar to the one which the original engineers of the stone mushroom colonies used. Now, I've been showing you lots of parallels between the structure of various stones which were grown and the structure of various plants. Now, I would like to point your attention to how Wikipedia explains these structural patterns. It labels them conveniently as a product of self-organization. And immediately they suggest something poetic to you, spontaneous. Wow! And now I want to show you something super cool and spontaneous. Did you know that if you put metal and plastic scrap in your washing machine and some salty water and rotate it long enough, eventually the scrap will self-organize itself into a beautiful smartphone with all the softwares already installed on it. And what's the proof that this can happen? The proof are the assurances of the penguins that the first living cell on Earth organized itself in the primeval salty soup. Of course, the penguins have tried many, many times experimenting to create even a single living cell and always failed. But still they swear up and down, it is possible. You simply haven't tried long enough. Not only the cell phone will self-organize itself in the washing machine, but even much more is possible, because even a single living cell is a much more complex system than a smartphone. And as far as real science, not the one preached on TV and in the schools, science based on what can be observed, Till date, only intelligent conscious beings have been observed to be capable of designing and putting together complex systems. Only conscious beings can design complex systems. Only conscious beings can design complex systems. The shameless lie that complex systems can organize themselves just like that, spontaneously, is a pivotal cornerstone of the belief system of the deceived modern man. It was very important for them to make the sheeple oblivious, unable to recognize the patterns which our benevolent creator used in his matrix. In this way, they could install and impose another matrix, the matrix of evil, which does not overwrite the original matrix of goodness, but it simply feeds on it. It is a parasitic way of existence, and that's why all kinds of parasitic social structures sprout, as they say, spontaneously in our society. Actually, it is not spontaneous again. It simply replicates the patterns of the parasitic grid in which humanity collectively has decided to participate. And how exactly did they manage to introduce amongst the people this very important cornerstone lie that I mentioned. They did it with the help of very thick books which the common man 
can't understand due to the difficult terminology. And all that is described in these thick books are various experiments and mental speculations about how could have the primordial soup self-organized itself into these complex systems that we observe. Countless miles long so-called scientific works are devoted on the question what kind of conditions were at that time so that they could have allowed or facilitated this self-organization. In this way they waste people's time and energy into such useless topics instead of telling them straightforwardly. We have tried many many times the experiment of placing the perfect ingredients in the most favorable and friendly environment and conditions and they have never, never, never organized themselves even at the slightest to produce even a single living and growing cell. Only conscious beings can design complex systems. Only conscious beings can design complex systems. And that is why we see the intelligent watermark of our Creator on all levels. On the level that we can perceive directly, the stones were grown and they have grid and patterns of growth. And on macro level, on planetary level, again we see designs which are not spontaneous, as they call them. For example, the landscape below North America is very similar to that below South America. The full picture with the small islands, the straight line, everything. <laughs> And now on the topic of split rocks, certainly some of them are divided in a way that doesn't have a natural feel to it. But that is only if we have a wrong concept of the nature of the stones as being alive and growing. For example, this is certainly a mushroom rock. We see the stems. And now see the split rocks from another perspective. The Devil's Tower in Wyoming, certainly the most impressive example of the numerous stone structures of this type which are to be found all over the globe. So officially we are told that this is solidified lava. So has it been actually observed that uh, the molten lava can form such structures or they just assume that it might be able to do so and then sell it to us as if it is some sort of a proven fact? Because I think that the Devil's Tower actually grew like most other stones and the grounds for that are the observations of how minerals grow. And the minerals, they are not just relatives of the rocks, they are not even brothers, they are the parents of the rocks. Don't you find it very obvious that since your parents grew from small children to adults, you would do the same?
now and then, during past life regressions, people remember previous lives of their souls, in which they were minerals or rocks, and sometimes in those states of trance, they will find information on who and why grew the stones that we now call mountains or deposits. For example, this is how somebody who remembered his previous life as a rock described the human race from his perspective. For him, the human life was as a blink, as a short spark of light. The various civilizations which were coming and going from the face of the earth appeared also very transient to him, like lightnings. He would notice them for a moment and then they are gone. And as far as who was coordinating all this growing of the rock on our planet, well, of course, on a global level, that was a work of the planetary scale, nature spirits or nature gods. But on a more local level, it would be various keepers of the human race or Maybe somebody would call them local deities or somebody else may find the term alien engineers more appropriate. And in some cases, even humans who were smart enough to be able to directly handle the subtle matrix of the original creator and manifest from it gross three-dimensional objects, such people also participated in the creation of the rocks on Earth. For example, here we see ruins of the rock-cut cities, and in the vicinity this really looks like footprints in the soft, before I would say mud, but now I understand that soft young stone would be more appropriate. Do you also notice the typical bulging here? How the stone dough was rising? So I've been on three expeditions myself and always this type of ruins were the main object of study together with the vehicle tracks which are related to them and it is now for the first time after I read the research of uh, Anthony Axenov that I can make some sense of it all. The footprints we saw earlier were in Turkey and this is from the Italy expedition. At least the two places there were similar tracks inside the via covers. They most definitely resembled the pathway for a rather large human. And again, it definitely looked like the stone was somewhat soft when this track was made. Maybe the stone hasn't matured yet at that point. According to the source which channeled information in trance, the um, rock-cut cities of Goreme and Cappadocia were constructed, so to say, by people who learned how to live together with the living stones. Maybe we could say that they domesticated the stones. Now, do you notice the white layer on the top of the rock-cut ruins? This is not snow. It looks as if somebody covered the ruins with some sort of foam. The same source explained that this was put together on the top, materialized, manifested from the ether, 
by the keepers of the time, the keepers of the human civilizations, later on, when these dwellings were no longer needed, he said they actually archived them, because an entirely different civilizations were about to come and populate the earth, and they would need a different type of environment, stage, for the theaters of their lives. And so this covering, protective layer of archiving was manifested from the subtle plane, subtle, the subtle energies of the universe within a matter of hours, days or a week, according to this source. The concept of stone softening as a possible way the ancient megaliths were built is well known. So instead of always looking for a recipe or techniques which could have softened the stone, how about considering that it could have been manipulated while it was still soft, freshly grown, so to say, or most likely first the grid was set in place and then the stone was maturing by itself in the given shape. But this is only a hypothesis for now. And even if it is true, it will certainly apply only for some megaliths. But as far as the structures that we've been calling meltaliths, those are surely rocks which have been grown. If you now watch again my couple of videos on the meltaliths, just turn off the sound and only watch the images and you will see usually at every meltalit site multiple signs that we are talking about rock that has been grown, cultivated. Now, why exactly will be different for each and every case? Some of them could be indeed old ruins, I'm talking about the meltalits. Others could be simply rock, part of the skin of Mother Earth. And it will look that it has intelligent design, because everything has intelligent design anyway. At other locations where the creations, the rock creations, the rock structures look pretty crazy, those could be rock nurseries or kind of rock laboratories, testing places. And yet other category of metalliths could be simply rock which has been grown with the idea to be harvested subsequently by mining. Much more about this particular point there will be in my next video. For example, here we have very regularly looking plates on the shore and then the lake is also suspiciously regularly shaped with multiple right angles. And this is what we observe always with the meltalits. Multiple unnatural features clustered together, like a type of stone which is alien to the area, then at places it looks molten, and then the cubes are very regular, and then the stones would display strange patterns, and all this is clustered together. Up until very recently, it looked hopeless for me to find explanation of all this taken together, although some features of the metalliths could have natural explanation, but only taken separately. And now, with this new information from Anthony, everything falls in place. Everything. And what is this? Some sort of stone glue? Nothing can surprise me anymore. And finally, when did we lose this knowledge? When did we forget how to grow and farm stones, rocks? I don't know the answer for now, but uh, here are some relatively recent statues. And if they have been made using this technique of um, growing stones, the answer is very, very recently. It's not clear for now if uh, 
that's the exact technique they used here but still I'm showing you the photographs for your own consideration Now let's pay a visit to the goblins, mushrooms everywhere. Now look at this particular mushroom here. At this point it is still, so to say, built in the wall, in the solid rock which has not yet eroded. And yet it is a fully recognizable mushroom, stone mushroom structure and all those other mushrooms on the right side they have this form not because the bedrock eroded in some funny fashion but because they looked like this always even before the softer feeling around them got washed away or in some cases there might have been no solid feeling around the mushrooms as well and here again Look at the bedrock, at the background, fully recognizable mushrooms. And here they have even dots on their heads, really like the plant mushrooms in the forest. But the actual reason for which I brought you here at the place of the goblins is because I want you to see how this colony of mushrooms looks on macro level so even on macro level it looks like a plant like something living usually in such cases the geologists start telling us stories that you see there was once upon a time a big spill of something liquid which solidified in this fashion really did it spill indeed what was it i see no source of such liquid whatsoever so now with this new information about how lots of the rock on earth is formed many of the mysteries so-called mysteries get solved like objects which look recent are found inside rocks. And when you test them in the laboratory, show the ages of millions of years. Actually, um, the modern geology knows very little about stone. Here is a petrified lake in a pretty much modern shoe, cowboy boot. Now, how much of the stone on earth was cultivated and how much of it has other origin? Geologists have defined three environments in which rocks form. 1. Igneous Igneous rocks form as molten rock cools and solidifies. Two sub-environments are distinguished. A. Underground, magma. And B. On the surface, lava. Number 2. Sedimentary Sedimentary rocks form as grains of sediment are attached to each other by a cement or by the interlocking of grains. And 3. Metamorphic Metamorphic rocks form as pre-existing rocks respond to a radical change in environment. 
most commonly an increase in temperature, pressure, and or an infusion of hot mineralized fluids. Fact or Fiction It's important to note that in general, these rock forming processes and the environments in which they take place cannot be observed. Solidification of magma, most changes in temperature and pressure sufficient to cause metamorphism, and most processes that attach sediment grains to one another occur out of sight beneath the Earth's surface. They are, therefore, not observed facts, but hypotheses that geologists in the 18th and 19th centuries constructed to explain features of rocks that they examined. Exceptions include the eruption and cooling of lava to form rock, the transformation of snow to ice, and the formation of salt rock in evaporating saline lakes, such as the Dead Sea or the Great Salt Lake, all of which can be observed. Gradually, these hypotheses gained acceptance and became elevated to the status of theories. Today, they are accepted by all geologists. Our task is to examine the basis for this belief. So when we put together all the information on cultivating rocks and the information gathered by the geologists, it turns out that probably most or all metamorphic rocks were grown, cultivated. And same would apply for some or all underground igneous rocks, as it was illustrated with the example of the Devil's Tower. And some, definitely not all, but some sedimentary rocks could have been also misunderstood by the modern geologists and could have been grown as well. Here is an example. So they are showing us photos like this and telling us, you see, this was a bottom of a lake or ocean once upon a time. And as the sediments turned into stone, that's how all this was formed. Looks good, but only so far. But if we have a look of how the layers are stacked, then questions arise. Okay, this process that they are telling us of the body of water, the bottom of a body of water turning into stone, is a very lengthy process. So it means that for each and every layer displaying this particular patterns, there has been a separate process of forming it in such a way. Which also, by the way, implies that the given body of water dried out. So what? Did we have like 40 lakes appearing one after another and then disappearing at very, very regular intervals of time? to form all these layers and there are quite few of these layers on this image we see part of the structure that is still standing it's made of this very same plates and again the stories that we are told of how the bottom of a body of water can turn into stone uh, supposedly take ages and are not something that can happen within a season Other unexplained structures, like the Eye of Sahara, may also find their explanation along the lines of the new information that we have about the cultivation of stone. 
The famous, mysterious and again unexplained Potomsky crater also clearly exhibits the features of growing rock. And just look what kind of uh, structures metals tend to form naturally. I think they begin to give us hints about their actual origin, which is probably very similar to that of the stones. The concept of growing our building materials is barely a new one. Discoveries have been made many years ago already. But of course, mass implementation of these discoveries will definitely not take place while we continue to live in the parasitic paradigm. These are one of the many inventions which will not reach most of the common people. Just It will not be allowed just because it will make our lives much easier. And then people will have time to think and they will have the ability to come out of the hamster wheel of being obliged to work like a donkey or a life if you wish to be part of the modern society. People don't even realize that it is exactly this fear that keeps them anchored in their slavery. Actually, if we want our society to return to normal, most of us will be losing our jobs and this will be a good sign because most of the work will be done in a much more e efficient way. We have already all the discoveries that we need. We have the star batteries that I have discussed in earlier videos. That means very, very cheap and almost free energy as much as we wish. We also have solar cars. The commercial models should have been manufactured already many years ago, but of course, magically it didn't happen. Even the hybrid bike here in Japan, which is electric, but also uses the power of magnets and uses minimal fuel. Also, the company which started manufacturing it somehow disappeared as well. And so people are back to the hamster wheel. Why? Because the television, the tell lie vision, convinces them every minute that having a job equals leading a better life. The better life will come when most of us don't have jobs. And this is a good illustration of another pivotal and cornerstone lie that the mass media has implanted in the society. We are not to blame. The truth is, we are the only ones to blame. It is very much a matter of personal choice. Do we decide to reside in the paradigm, in the matrix of the benevolent creator or in the matrix of the parasites? It is essential for the parasitic forces to convince us and that we don't have any choice but to stick to them just to remain alive. And it is not at all by chance that the visionary magical plants used by our forefathers, who were free by the way, are now by chance mistakenly put in the same category as harmful drugs, which also exist, and thus the visionary plant teachers are declared illegal. It is not by chance that they offer decades of time in prison for those who use the visionary plants. That is indeed an extreme danger, extreme danger to the parasitic paradigm, the parasitic matrix, because the visionary plant teachers directly clean the malevolent software programs for, from the people who come in touch with them. The malevolent software programs installed 
in us, in our psyche, by the mass media and the society infected by this mass media. And keeping us blind about so many things is a prime tool used by these parasitic, malevolent pieces of software. And we have reached such a deep bottom of ignorance that the so-called scientists glorified on TV and so on usually will tell you much less about the true matrix of the creator and how things are than certain artists who from their hearts will feel better the benevolent matrix of the creator and will recognize its patterns As our desire to know more and experience how does it feel to live in the matrix of the Creator grows, proportionally to that, the grip of the parasitic paradigm will get weaker. He was the wizard of a thousand kings And I chanced to meet him one night wandering He told me tales and he drank my wine Me and my magic man kind of feel 